Now we're going to get into some of the specific physiologies and how they may look on ultrasound and how we're going to approach this. And you'll notice that we're going to kind of lump hypovolemic and hemorrhagic shock and distributive shock together because physiologically when you look at their heart and their IVC they generally are going to look pretty similar and these things when they first present may also be vague patients may just present with kind of confusion weakness fatigue and things may not be that clear on initial presentation so this is kind of classic typically what you're going to see with these patients so you're going to see a vigorous heart we see here that the endocardium of this heart during systole almost slaps together. So their ejection fraction here is like 85% because you see how, how much that ventricle is emptying with each contraction. Similar here, now the tachycardia sometimes fools your eyes to make you think the heart is more vigorous than it is. So this heart's definitely tachycardic, but it's probably slightly hyperdynamic too. We see the endocardium coming pretty close together during systole. And classically, we should see a pretty flat and collapsing IVC in these patients. So this is our kind of typical physiologic appearance of hypovolemic slash hemorrhagic or distributive shock. This is what it's going to typically look like, assuming the patient has a baseline pretty normal physiology. Now obstructive shock, what's that going to look like? Well, one form of it, if it's from a massive PE, you're going to see a big giant right ventricle that compresses the left ventricle. And that's the main things I like to remember. Now you can look for other things like paradoxical septal motion where the septum dips towards the left during diastole. And you may see loss of IVC phasicity. And this may be due to an acute, you know, massive, submassive PE. If they're in shock, then by definition, it's a massive PE. The thing, just like everything else that we do with ultrasound, just beware that there may be patients walking around with chronic right heart failure, and then they may also be in septic shock. So we have to use our brains. The ultrasound doesn't tell us what to do. It gives us information, and we have to incorporate that information into the entire clinical picture. But some more examples here where we see a, a large dilated right ventricle, compression of the left with the septum moving towards the left during diastole. Again, very large right ventricle here. Left ventricle is compressed the septum pushes to the left. Now this, this case may have some degree of chronicity as we see to this kind of enlarged right atrium. So just a good example of how we, we have to incorporate the entire clinical picture. The next form of obstructive shock is gonna be cardiac tamponade. And typically you know, one of the main findings is pericardial fluid collection. Now it may be fluid, it may be blood, it may be pus, it could be lots of things. In this case, it's simple. So we see a large fluid collection in this parasternal long axis for you. We see this fluid collection pinches up in between the left atrium and the descending thoracic aorta. That's a very important landmark and we'll look at that some more. Here again, we see circumferential pericardial fluid and in both of these cases, we see collapse of the right ventricle that worsens during diastole. And another thing that I think that I've noticed in patients with tamponade that I don't feel like is talked about a lot, but if you pay attention, the left ventricles in these cases are somewhat compressed as well. So something I've started asking myself when I see patients with pericardial effusions is how does the left ventricle look? Because if the left ventricle is nice and has a good size and is filling and emptying well, then that patient's going to be able to compensate for at least a while. But in these cases, in both of them, not only is the right ventricle collapsed during diastole, but the left ventricle, see how small the left ventricle is in these cases? And that's because it's, it's not able to fill effectively. It's not receiving preload. So an under underappreciated finding in cardiac tamponade is a small size or compression of the left ventricle. And in these cases, you should in typically also see a loss of phasicity in the inferior vena cava, kind of the opposite of what we see in hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock where the IVC is collapsed and compressible. And then in other scenarios, again, we probably have some other clinical clues, but tension pneumothorax would be another etiology of obstructive shock. And if we look at the lungs, we would notice we've got ribs with shadows, and along the pleural line, we should see some pleural sliding and we see absolutely none. And it's never a bad idea to compare to the uh, other side to look for that. But here we see no sliding. If this patient's in shock and we don't see sliding, not a bad idea to go ahead and decompress that chest and we'll, we'll get into which way you might do that. In these cases of obstructive shock, 
all these are going to usually increase right atrial pressure, which is going to transmit into a loss of phasicity in the IVC. And we can see that here. This is actually a case of tamponade, the right atrium. We see the right atrium here. There's actually a large effusion here causing this patient's shock. And this IVC, it's kind of dilated, and you see it does not change shape at all with respiration. We see even some of that dilation transmitting into a dilated middle hepatic vein as well.